And um, can we just thank the Lord this morning for the privilege that we have uh, to come into a room like this and, and to stand in the, the same presence of the Spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead Amen. to feast on the bread of life, the living Word of God, to worship the Lamb that was slain, that forgives sins today and heals hearts and wraps his arms around people that are hurting, people that are lonely, who's a father to the fatherless. Can, can we just take a moment just right where you are and just, can we just give him thanks for the privilege we have to be in his presence today? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just love you. And once again, we welcome you. We thank you for, for choosing to come and to, to meet with us, to be with us today. God, we thank you for every person that is listening today, watching from home, watching online. God, we thank you for every person who has, has come out today and made the choice, made the decision to come and to be in your house. Lord, I thank you, Lord. Thank you for being with us. Lord, we are your, your people, and you are our God, Lord, and we seek to honor you. We seek to, to bring glory to you today, and, and we just invite you in now, in this moment, Lord, to, to speak to us, to minister to us. Meet us right where we are, Lord, today, we pray, and we ask all of this in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen. Turn and smile real big. Hug somebody, shake somebody's hand this morning one more time before you take a seat. It is good to be in this house, amen? Despite the weather, uh, it's kind of nasty out this morning, but it's nice and dry and, and warm and friendly in here, and you guys look amazing. Um, we have a, a very special treat with us this morning before we get into... Uh, our message and continue in our in our series. Um, we have a guest with us this morning that <clears throat> that I want you to hear from. Uh, she's someone who who uh, her work, her ministry, her organization is no stranger to us here at Neighborhood Church. We've been supporting them for for years. Uh, the work that they do, and we have invited. Um, the executive director of Obria Medical Clinics to be with us this morning. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to ask Robin if you'll go ahead and, and come on up and join me on the stage. Um, let's make Robin welcome this morning. <laughs> go ahead and give you this, Robin. So this is Robin Mock, and Robin is the executive director of Obria Medical Clinics. And um, uh, let me just say that uh, I feel like this is a, a very, very important time, very important season. You'll understand a little bit more just how significant it is after you hear Robin this morning. But uh, we've been supporting um, Obria for a number of years now financially because we, we believe in the, the uh, incredible work and ministry that they do. Um, the first class care that they give to, to women before, during, and after pregnancy to women right here in our community. Um, not just first class, uh, fully licensed medical care uh, and attention, but uh, they minister to these, to these ladies and, um, in a powerful way, life-changing ways. And so uh, something that we can definitely get behind because it is harder and harder and harder to find an organization uh, in, in the culture that we live in that believes in and stands for and promotes the sanctity of life. And they do it so well. And so um, we've invited Robin to come in and share with us so that you can put a, a, a face to the name and the organization. Uh, she is the, uh, the, the woman that makes it happen and leads so well. And uh, I wanted you to hear from her personally and uh, just so that we can make an even more personal connection now that you see her and you, after you hear from her. Uh, not only will you work hard out on, out on that Christmas tree lot every year to raise funds, but I know that you'll join in with your prayers for Robin and Obria as well. So, uh, Robin, I will let you take it from here. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you for having me today. I am a preacher's kid. 
So I know what it means to let someone come up on your stage and speak. So thank you to Tori and Polly for allowing me. And also thank you to you guys for the work you do for us each year at Christmas. We so appreciate it. Um, I want to give you a little background on myself. I started volunteering at Obria back in 2006. And at that time, it was the Pregnancy Resource Center of Gwinnett. Some of you may know us by that name. In 2018, um, we expanded our services and became Obria under the national brand. So we still keep our own same board, our own bylaws, but they help us with branding, uh, best practices, and that kind of thing. Um, I've been married for 32 years. I have six daughters. Um, <laughs> And so you don't have to ask me all these questions afterwards. We're not Catholic. We're not Mormon. Um, they're all ours. We're not a blended family, and we were not trying for a boy. Um, <laughs> outside, of my, outside of my God, my husband, and my family, nothing brings me greater joy than a newborn baby. And so every time our girls started to toddle around, I was ready for another one. And so it's kind of unique that God has placed me where he has in this season of life to minister to so many moms and their little babies. So abortion, that's a heavy word. It's a word that um, we don't say very often. We don't talk about. Um, our, our culture um, has taken it and politicized it um, taken away the fact of a value of that of a of it being right or wrong um, and they've they not only they used to tell girls that it was just a piece of tissue okay you remember that now the abortionists tell girls it is a life because science has proven that it is a life but it's a life worth sacrificing we live in an age of instant gratification. We live in an age of um, we can do whatever we want. Um, I've seen um, reels on social media of college students yelling, I can do whatever I want. And so God has been completely taken out of the equation. Um, I believe we see, we see three different girls at Obria. There are those, a handful of girls who know what abortion is, they don't care, they're going to have one no matter what we tell them. Um, they even use it as a form of birth control. And then we have girls, and I would say this is the major number of girls, who have just been deceived by our culture, and they believe it's a, a valid medical procedure, it's one of their valid options, um, and they don't know any better. And then we have another group of girls who grew up in the church. They know it's wrong, but they don't want to bring the shame onto their family and onto their church. And so they believe abortion is their only way out. Today, we commemorate the 50th anniversary of the tragic Supreme Court decision of Roe v. Wade, which legalized abortion through birth in our country. In July, the heartbeat bill was enacted here in Georgia. Um, so now in the state of Georgia, it's illegal for a girl to have an abortion after there's a heartbeat. Undoubtedly, this is saving lives. I believe that pocket of girls who know it's wrong and had someone pressuring her to have an abortion is relieved. Now she can't do it. We won't see those numbers. But what we see happening at our clinic is girls are taking the abortion pill immediately without a doctor's care, without an ultrasound to even make sure it's a viable pregnancy. One in five, one in four, um, depending on where you're looking, pregnancies end in miscarriage. She may not have even had to go through that process of an abortion. And so um, we're there to give her the support she needs to choose life. Not only are we, so let me back up on the abortion pill. There are over 700 illegal sites that girls can purchase an abortion pill without the oversight of a doctor. We now see CVS and Walgreens dispensing the abortion pill through their pharmacy. I'm not a big boycott person. I go to Target. I go to um, 
uh, what's the big coffee place? Um, Starbucks, yeah. You know, I believe I need to be a light <clears throat> in places of darkness. But when an organization steps up and actually partakes in the process of an abortion, I have a real problem with that. I'm not going back to CVS and Walgreens. I can find their services other places. And so, you know, sometimes the dollar is where we have to speak. So I encourage you, if you feel the same way I do, contact your local CVS or Walgreens. If you don't, that's fine. But that's just my little rant for the day. Um, all right, for just a moment, I want us to listen to a video that really illustrates the magnitude of abortion in our country. Right where you are, I just want you to, right there in your seats, just shut your eyes. What you're about to hear are the sounds of metal BB striking the side of a tin can. For every BB that strikes, it represents 10,000 lives lost in the wars of America's past. 10,000 lives for every BB. This is the reality of what is occurring in your country. The American Revolution, the Civil War, World War One, World War Two, the Korean Conflict, the Conflict in Vietnam. September 11th and the War on Terror. Since 1973, the War of the Unborn Child. God help us. That gets me every time I hear it. Over 63 million lives have been lost to abortion. You know, abortion touches many lives. I dare say it may have touched your life. You may know a friend. You may have a family member. Um, you may be a woman who had an abortion. You may be a man who assisted a girlfriend or a wife by either paying for an abortion or simply stating, I'll support whatever decision you make. That decision is not the unpardonable sin. Um, God can take that and re forgive and redeem. We, um, we provide a program called Exchange at Obria, and this is support groups for women who have an abortion in their past. Statistically, it is said in the church, one in three women have had an abortion and no one knows. The tragic emotional um, consequences of abortion um, can show itself in anxiety, depression, eating disorders, um, suicidal um, ideation, numerous things. And sometimes women don't even realize that that is where it all goes back to. Um, what, we are see what we've seen in the past is women uh, who had an abortion 25, 30 years ago uh, in the last, what, 31 years that we've been in existence, um, finally came to terms to deal with. But now that there's an abortion pill where a woman 
has become her own abortionist and is having the abortion in her bathroom by herself, we are having women in our support groups who are three weeks post-abortive, three months post-abortive. So if you are one of those people, please let us help you. There's a QR code on the screen you can scan, or you can go to our website, ovaria.org, and call our clinic to get more information. We actually have a man going through training right now. This has been a prayer for years that we would be able to offer um, abortion support to men. So we will be having that um, in the near future. All right, on the screen, um, if you'll go to the next slide, you'll see our mission and vision. And you may, be, you may look at that and say, well, I don't see anything about pro-life and saving babies. We believe that to really be truly pro-life, we've got to offer that girl all the wraparound services, all the support that she needs to ultimately have optimal health physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Um, so that's why you see the mission and vision statements there. I want to next. I want to introduce you to our team. Um, I'm sure there's one person up there that you recognize. We've had Carson on our team for about three months now. <laughs> Woohoo! And let me just tell you, I had the privilege of observing her in the classroom um, last week, and she is phenomenal. And I, I know I don't have to tell y'all that, but um, I've had uh, long-term teachers want her to come teach at their school. And I'm like, no, you're not getting her. Um, she's ours. So she's, she's just a natural. She's doing a great job in our Empowered program. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But we have um, on our team, all of our um, medical team is licensed. We have two OBGYNs. One is our medical director. We have three RNs, two nurse practitioners. One of our nurse practitioners is a midwife. And we have three medical assistants and two sonographers. So God has really blessed us with an amazing team. We have very little um, employee turnover. Uh, we really are like a family, and it's a joy to work with these folks. I want to show you next a brief video about Obria that will tell you a lot more than I can tell you just standing up here. So everybody's got a story, and it's a lot of times something that's uncomfortable to talk about, but most everybody that comes in is coming for a reason that they, they have a concern. So they're a little bit anxious or they're a lot anxious. I was really scared. I didn't know what to do. I started crying. I didn't know how I was gonna tell my mom. Most everything that we see women for has some level of emotion that goes with it. We just wanna be here to walk with them through those things and make it a little bit less scary. So my name is Rebecca. I am 23 and my son's name is Joseph. I feel like Obria impacted my life personally. It definitely made my decision of keeping Joseph easier because I had more of a support system. I wasn't as scared as I would have been if I was by myself. So I think that really helped a lot. It made me, um, it made me brave. They're not just a patient, not just a number, not just another baby to be delivered. They're part of our family. We've already cared about them from day one and we wanna provide the best service in a family-like caring environment. We wanna serve them as a whole woman going through a stage in her life that's important. We wanna be a part of it. Obri has been serving the community since 1991. Um, we started out as a resource center for pregnant moms. We eventually began expanding our services in 2018, and we currently are providing pregnancy verification for pregnancy Medicaid, full panel STD testing and treatment, well woman care, and full prenatal care all the way through 40 weeks. So I did prenatal care here, and that was a huge help because I didn't have to go anywhere else. Obria also has a program called Thrive, which is our education program, and our prenatal patients can join this program. Through it, they learn about healthy pregnancy, parenting skills, life skills, all the things they need to know to be a great parent. They take their classes online, and through this, they earn points, and they can use their points to shop in the baby boutique for their baby. It's been helping a lot. I come here and I get baby stuff. It saves me a lot of money. 
In 2016, we've expanded our services so that if we can't meet her need, we know who can and we can refer her because we believe it's so important that her needs be met so that she has the support she needs to be that healthy mom that she needs to be. We are a nonprofit clinic that is funded by individuals, organizations, and grants, so therefore we are able to provide our services at free or low cost. Okay. I guess I made a personal connection here. I made a family here. I feel like Opia helped me feel a lot better about, you know, becoming a new mom. It was a really good experience for me. If you would like more information, please visit obria.org. Okay, I'm gonna go through the next slides fairly quickly, but I just wanna kind of give you an overview. We, um, we have a three-prong approach prevention, intervention, and education. We'll go to the next slide. Um, so first of all, our prevention strategy is we believe it's important to get in front of the girl before she's in an unplanned pregnancy. So that's why we offer full panel STD testing and treatment for men and women and well woman care. We also have the prevention program and in our empowered program, which is the program that Carson works in. And this is where we go into local Christian schools and local organizations and teach an abstinence-based education, which we now call sexual risk avoidance education. Um, and this is uh, uh, built upon health, teaching our youth what healthy relationships look like, what the red flags are to look for. Um, it's about goal setting, effective communication. So I wanna show you a brief video, another one, um, about our Empowered program so you can kind of see an overview of that real quick. Obria Medical Clinics is the only life-affirming, accredited, nonprofit women's healthcare clinic serving the North Metro Atlanta area. Obria saw the need for a pregnancy prevention program back in 2002, and since then we have served over 140,000 youth with a sexual risk avoidance message. Our educational program, called Empowered, serves schools and community organizations by presenting factual consequences associated with at-risk sexual behaviors. I learned a lot about how to communicate and how to really have a healthy relationship and a lot about boundaries and things like that. My biggest takeaway from Empowered was that just when your family's on a path that it can highly affect your future. Often young people do not have an example of a healthy relationship in their own lives. Empowered provides them with the tools to identify how to have a healthy relationship break the cycle and plan for their future. Decide how far you can go, break this is just conversation that is not taught in any of the other areas of our curriculum. And so we feel the need to really address it in a crucial conversation. We think it's very important to have these conversations. Time together is focused on sex. We utilize a curriculum that has proven effective in lowering the teen pregnancy rate, meets all state health standards, and our staff is fully certified in sexual risk avoidance education. It shows you like the rights and wrongs of relationship and like why you shouldn't do this and how it could affect you later in life. Can we get this order? What? Knowing what not to do and what to do when situations come up, like if you're getting peer pressured into stuff or other things, just relying on that for the future. My future has been impacted because I feel like through everything that I've learned, I have learned how to like emotionally deal with a lot of the things that I didn't know how to before. So I really felt like I learned a lot from it. Then the yes, but we thought. At Obrio, we see the growing need that our youth have and the impact that we can have on them through the Empowered program. Uh, yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Yes, I really do. Yes! So a study was done um, comparing youth with a religious background and youth without a religious background. And what they found was youth with a religious background are having sex more often than youth without a religious background and with more partners. And so we have made our focus going into Christian and private schools. Um, right now, Gwinnett County Public Schools is changing, trying to change the curriculum to um, comprehensive sex. Um, there, if you want to reach out to your local school board, anyone you know, and just voice your opinion on that, that would be great. I don't know how far down we are on it. They've already had let um, parents um, submit their um, 
comments, and so I'm not sure what the next step is, but we were, we've been in the Gwinnett County Schools for years, and now we cannot be in there. So we're focused on private schools because we see the need. There has not been a, any program like this in every Christian school that we've presented to so far. And, um, you know, it's not a small conversation about the birds and the bees like it was when you and I were growing up, right? This is a conversation that's got to be going on daily between a parent and a child, and sometimes it's awkward. And so we want to come alongside in this program. We actually send home um, a connection card with the student to their parents to help them talk about these um, crucial issues. All right, so our next um, prong and my phone went to sleep on me. Um, our next prong is uh, intervention. And this is um, through our medical, and you saw a lot about this on the slide, but we do options consultation, helping them understand what their options, whether they can carry to term, terminate, or make an adoption plan. And then we also do pre-abortion screening. And you may say, well, why are you doing that? You're not an abortion facility. That's because we care about the woman. And even if she makes that choice, we want to make sure she's as healthy as she can be. Right now, if she takes the abortion pill and her hemoglobin is below 9.5, she's at a high risk of hemorrhaging in her bathroom. And so we perform these blood tests to educate her and make her understand the risk that she's setting herself in and to make sure if she moves forward, she's as safe as she can be and that we're there for her afterwards. We do um, abortion follow-up exams now too. Most girls who have one abortion have two. And so we want to be there for her that second pregnancy when she comes back to us and says, that was a horrible experience. I don't wanna do that again. You cared for me the first time. I want you to care for me this time. All right, the next slide. Um, the other piece to the intervention is our social services program, providing her all the resources she needs to choose life. I want to tell you a quick story. We had a girl call us on a Thursday afternoon. We closed down at 5 o'clock on Thursdays for the weekend, and she was, um, her boyfriend um, was being physically abusive. He threatened to kill her if she didn't have an abortion. So she came to us with nothing but her purse, and said, I need help. Well, of course, we couldn't find anywhere, any shelter, any place for her to go. Um, Gwinnett County is just full of um, people needing housing. So um, we took her to the cell phone store, got her a new SIM card so he couldn't track her, got her what she needed for the evening as far as something to sleep in, toothbrush, toothpaste, all that, put her up in a hotel to give us a few days to try and find her a place. Really, what she needed was someone just to come alongside her and help her diffuse the situation and to think calmly. And she finally decided to go back to Florida to where her parents were. She sent us an email a few weeks ago showing her big pregnant belly and telling us that Obria had saved her life. So, yeah. All right, and then the third prong is education, and you saw in the video how the girls can take um, their classes online and then shop for brand new items in our baby boutique. Here's, um, next slide is a, some pictures of a few of our babies. Um, not every story is a success story, but I do want to leave you with one last miracle. Um, we provide abortion pill reversal, so if a girl uh, takes the first set of pills which block um, the nutrition from the baby and starts regretting her decision, gets on her phone, Googles, how do I stop my abortion? It'll take her to the abortion um, pill reversal hotline. Uh, we're one of the few clinics in the metro Atlanta that provide this service. She'll call us. We start her on high dosages of progesterone, which is the same um, the same protocol for a woman likely to miscarry, and then we monitor her with ultrasounds weekly. We had, about two months ago, we had two girls who went through the reversal process, and they each had twin babies. So, all right, and the final slide, um, well, no, this is the final slide. Um, let me just say thank you for having me today. There's going to be a quick video um, after I sit down, but I'll be out front if um, afterwards. If you have any questions, you can go to our website, support OMCG, to sign up for a tour. We'd love to show you the place or to be on our mailing list. Thank you.
Created in the image of the Creator. A promise. A masterpiece. A life. On January 22nd, 1973, a decision was made in our nation to legalize abortion at any stage for any reason. 49 years later, that decision was finally reversed. 49 years of prayer and perseverance. 49 years of being a voice for the unborn, proclaiming their humanity and their possibility. 49 years of striving to reach their moms and dads, proclaiming there's hope and a future. 49 years of waiting for life to be upheld in our nation. And here we are. This January is the first post-Roe in our nation. Roe versus Wade, as we know it, is no longer. As we grieve that loss of over 60 million lives and the devastating cost to their moms and dads, we give thanks for the lives that will be saved and protected from this date forward. Because of this decision, already thousands of moms have chosen life. The lives of thousands of children have been saved. They will celebrate a first birthday. They will experience their first day of kindergarten, their first best friend, their first home run, their first dance, their high school graduation, and so many things beyond. We celebrate this victory, and yet know there is much more to be done. There are still unexpected pregnancies. It is still a crisis. They still need hope and help. Our services are needed now more than ever. You can make a difference for life. You can pray. You can give. You can serve. Will you? I just want to say thank you to Robin with my microphone on. There we go. Uh, I just want to thank you one more time, Robin, for coming. This is such a, uh, such a big deal, so important, the work that, uh, that you're doing and that you're doing through Obria. Um, if there has ever been an organization that uh, I believe God cares about, cares deeply about, um, and is always watching, it is this one. And um, uh, we just want to show you our appreciation and encourage you today. I want to introduce these three handsome young men that are coming to the stage right now. <clears throat> Sam Bolt, Craig Cothern, and Michael Wheatley. These are our Buy a Tree, Change a Life directors. <clears throat> and um, I got to share with you a little bit before church uh, that uh, the, the funds uh, for the last several years that we have been able to contribute to Obria have come because our, our church, every November-ish, uh, December, uh, we sell about six, 700 Christmas trees, and we support local organizations here in our community that are doing great things, in particular with women and children. And, um, and so this year, uh, our directors wanted to present you with a check for $10,000. That's so awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you know, you guys, I want you to know you're affecting generations to come. Thank you, Robin. Amen. Amen. Appreciate you. Thank you, guys. Are you here today? If you're here, say here. here. Listen, did you know that it, it is hard to be somewhere that you're not? <clears throat> That was a brilliant statement. Come on. It is hard to be somewhere that you're not, right? Um, I want to talk to you just for a, a very few minutes. How many of you think I can share this message and have you out of here in 10 minutes? You know better than that. Um, it's going to be an abbreviated message this morning. Um, but I, but I, want to, I want to share with you a thought that just is kind of a continuation with our, our theme for this month. And and the series we've been in, the study around Sabbath that we've been taking our church through, in particular with our house groups, all of our house groups, um, uh, studying the same uh, material focused around Sabbath, focused around 
uh, basically following and living the way that Jesus lived, practicing the ways of Jesus. And we've begun with this practice, this ancient practice that we have dove back into in a rediscovering uh, called Sabbath, where we take a day out of the week because God did, because Jesus did, because we're commanded to. Um, we've been given this gift of Sabbath where we take the time to stop and to, to reset and to, to focus in on, on what and who matters the most in our lives, to, to, to just rest and to uh, delight in God and His creation and the good things He has given us and to worship Him deeply. So uh, just in, along these same thoughts, I want to share with you three passages of Scripture briefly this morning um, that kind of are just a continuation in this same vein, if you will. And the first one is kind of an unusual text, but one you're familiar with. It was Jesus' first miracle when he turned the water into wine. Do you remember that? Uh, Jesus is at a wedding and they run out of wine and his mom comes and says, Jesus, will you please come? And we talked a little bit about this last week and he turns the water into wine. He gets... um, Uh, six massive jars, and theologians tell us these were massive containers, probably 20 or 30 gallons each. And he tells the servants, he says, go fill these with water and take to the master of the banquet and have him draw the water out. And so the Bible says in John chapter 2, they did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside, and he said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. And I love that he chose to use those words, you have saved the best till now. We say, we have a saying that we say often, you save the best to last. And I love that he used the words, you have saved the best till now. And I want to talk to you briefly just about this gift, the gift of now, the gift of the present who you have before you, who is in front of you, what is in front of you, the, the gift that you have been giving of, of now, of the present. There is a better way of living, right? We've been talking about that for almost a month now, the way of Jesus, the way that Jesus lived his life. We've been talking about not just, not just believing what Jesus believed, but, but following his ways and, and practicing the way that Jesus lived his life. And one of the most striking qualities um, that marked Jesus' life here on earth was his, his amazing ability to be fully present, Regardless of who was in front of him, the task, the situation, circumstances, he, w- he always had this capacity to be fully present in every single moment, to give his undivided attention in every moment. So two more passages of Scripture. They're back-to-back stories in Luke's gospel. The first one takes place as Jesus walks into Jericho. Actually, both of them do. This first one, as Jesus walks into Jericho, and the Bible says large crowds surrounded him, and a blind beggar by the name of Bartimaeus screams out, cries out to Jesus. He says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the the text says that the disciples rebuked this blind beggar, and Jesus turns and says to him, what do you want me to do for you? So Jesus stopped, fully present in the moment, and took the time for a guy that no one else had time for. Stopped, took the time for someone, a poor beggar that no one else ever had time for. The second passage comes right after that in Luke chapter 19. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. So this time, Jesus was was passing through. 
He, he had somewhere else to be. He had a schedule. He was busy. He had important tasks. He had a mission. He had a responsibility. He was on his way to fulfill. He was passing through, the Bible says, some, to go to somewhere else. He's already been interrupted once by a man that nobody else had time for, but Jesus made time for him. And now this second time, he stops for a rich, wealthy, corrupt tax collector that no one wants anything to do with. So Jesus took the time to be fully present for a man who, who no one had time for, and he also had time to be fully present for a man that nobody wanted to make time for, a rich, wealthy man. So Zacchaeus is this, this tax collector. Jesus calls, he's a crooked IRS agent, if you will, who charges people exorbitant amounts for their taxes and then adds exorbitant amounts on top of that to keep for himself personally. He's a crook, the lowest of the low in society, yet very rich, very wealthy. And Jesus stops, is fully engaged in this man. He calls him by name, says, Zacchaeus, I need to come to your house today. Zacchaeus, I want to come and, and, and spend a couple of hours with you today. Keep in mind, Jesus was on his way somewhere else. He had a busy schedule. He had things to accomplish. He's the son of God, and he was fully present here again in a moment where most, pe most people would have run the complete opposite direction, and it had such an impact on this man's life, this rich, wealthy, corrupt man, such an impact that the man says to Jesus that he will give all his possessions to the poor, and I'm going to give back four times any amount that I have stolen or cheated from anyone. And Jesus turns to him and he says, today, salvation has come to your house, Zacchaeus. So why and, and, and how could this even happen? Let me answer the why first. The why is something that we, we need to remind ourselves of so often that Jesus cares about everyone everyone the same, whether it's the poorest and the lowest of the low that nobody has the time to stop for, or whether it's the wealthy, rich, corrupt that everyone despises and everyone in between. Jesus cares that every one of them receive his miracle of salvation, that they come to know him. Every single person that we pass and encounter, how could this happen? This happened because Jesus had had the, the capacity, the, the margin, and, and the bandwidth, if you will, to be fully present in the moment. Something that we tend to struggle with in this country, something that most of us, something that I tend to struggle with, being able to be present in every moment with whatever is in front of me, with whoever is in, in, in front of me. Um, well, you don't understand, Pastor, because uh, it's hard to be present in the moment in my stage of life because I've got two toddlers and a baby and a dog, and at my house, it's, it's chaos. And it's just hard to be, my, my mind's always scattered, always different places. And, and, and I would just say to you um, as lovingly as I can, because I, I've, I've been there, um, let's be careful not to, to complain about moments that we will sorely miss tomorrow. And all the parents in the room today with grown children can say amen. Those moments are here today and they are gone tomorrow. Let's be present in every single possible moment. Are you still here? All right. Listen, because statistics say that you won't be for long. Uh, Harvard did a study that said 47% of the time, so almost half the time that we're awake, our mind is not the same place that our feet are. It wonders. I mean, how many times throughout the morning already today has your mind wandered to, to, to your phone to check a text or wonder what the buzz was? Was that an email? Was that a text? Was that a respond? Or maybe, maybe you're even guilty of checking your Instagram this morning during church or thinking about where you're going to eat for lunch or what wasn't done and has to get done and who's playing football this afternoon. Our minds wander. Almost 50% of the time, our minds are not the same place our feet are. They wander different places. 
the average cell phone user touches their cell phone 2,617 times a day. And for you overachievers, you extreme top 10 percenters, that jumps to 5,400 times a day that you touch your cell phone. Now listen, when we're not just randomly allowing our minds to go different places, we play mind games all the time. We play the, 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 the win-then game and the what-if game, the win-then game. You know, when we're in high school, we think, man, when, when I'm a senior, you know, I'm a freshman, oh, when I'm a senior, or when we're in, a senior, we think, oh, when I'm in college, it'll be, and then when we're in college, we think, oh, when I can get a job, and then when we get a job, it's like, oh, when I can get a real job, and then when we get a real job, it's like, oh, if we can just get a, a, a better house to live in, and then we have babies and we're like, oh, when the babies are out of diapers, and before you know it, we blink, and we go, oh, I'm in diapers again. And, and all of a sudden, where did all of the time go, and where did all of the years go? And, and we, we spend our time, listen, this is why Sabbath, taking the time to stop and to, to reset and to, and to focus and to enjoy where we are in life and embrace where we are and embrace and enjoy the people who's in front of us, the now. That's why it's so, so, so important in our lives. Listen, don't miss the gift of now, what's right in front of you, pursuing what you want later. Don't miss what's in front of you now. And then we play the what if game. You know, what if, what if I don't pass this test? If I don't pass this test, then, then, then I won't get into the school that I want to get into. And if I don't get into the school that I want to get into, then I'm not going to get a job. And so I'll never have a real job. And, and if I don't have a real job, I'm not going to meet a, a real man or, or a real woman. I'm not going to have real babies. And if I have a real job, I'm not going to be able to afford braces. And then my kids are going to marry ugly people and they're going to have a, a bad life because, they, because I couldn't afford braces. And, and we play the, the what, what if game with our lives. And Jesus has a, has a now gift for you and me. Are you ready for it? Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 6. He said, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has enough to worry about itself. Tomorrow has its own worries. Listen, Jesus t- didn't tell you not to plan for the future. He didn't tell you to go climb up under a rock and build a bomb shelter and go live in it. He just said, don't worry. Don't worry about tomorrow. Listen, there's a now that he has given us. There are people right in front of us every day that he has placed in our path. There are moments that he has given us. So why don't we live in the moment. Are you ready? We don't live in the moment. We don't live in the now. We don't enjoy, embrace. We miss out on so much because we have a lack of margin in our lives. This is one of the things we've been talking about with, with our, our study on Sabbath. We don't, we don't have a margin built into our lives. We never stop. We're too tired. It's this endless pursuit of American misery. Um, and this makes us consumed with ourselves. So we don't live in the now. We have a lack of faith that prohibits us from living in the now. And it's difficult to to have faith, to trust in him if we're consumed with self. Instead of resting in him, we just stay tired in ourselves. We're not living the way that Jesus lived. One of, the, one of the keys, the biggest keys to having faith and being present in the moment is to surrender the past that you can't change and to trust God with a future that you can't control. It's hard to have faith. It's hard to, it's hard to live in, in, in the now and enjoy and embrace the moments and, and the now that God has given us if we're focused on a past or if we're worried about the future. Jesus said, or, or, or the, James said this, the half-brother of Jesus in chapter 4 of James, he said, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. I love what the great psalmist said, he said, like, like sands of the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. <laughs> I think that was a soap opera, actually. Um, but there was a lot of uh, profound wisdom in that analogy with, with the hourglass, right? 
Because we have no idea, when you think about that hourglass, you have no idea how much sand is in the top of that thing. And you can't control how fast it flows through the middle. And once it's in the bottom, you can never get it back. That's why the true psalmist, David, said this. He said in Psalm 118, this is the day the Lord has made. This day. What day? The day you're living in. The day you wake up in. The day you're breathing in. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And and now, this day, because this is the day that God has given me. None of us are promised tomorrow. We're not to worry about tomorrow, but he's given us today. Let's make, let's live in it. Let's, Let's embrace the now. Let's embrace the people. Let's embrace the moments. Let's embrace God and be all that we can be in him today in, in the now. Are you still here? Are you good, good. Because listen, you can't be rejoi- you can't rejoice and be glad where you're not. You can't rejoice and be glad when you're not present. You can't be happy when you're not present. You can't serve Jesus where you're not. You can't love people where you're not. And we're called to love God and we're called to love people. In the big moments, let's be fully present. In the small moments, listen, I, I found that, that many of the smallest, tiniest moments are the most significant in life. Let's be present in all of the moments. Don't miss the gift of now pursuing what you want later. Again, this whole idea, this whole command of Sabbath uh, being rested to focus back, put our focus back where our focus belongs, belongs so that we can be present, so that we can be in tune with the Lord, so that we're able to hear his voice and available to respond. As the band joins me this morning on the stage, I just want to close and ask you to think about something that is, that is so powerful to me. And this is inspiring me and encouraging me to, to work hard and to work harder to be present, to be present, whoever I'm talking to, to be listening, to be intent, to be present in the moment, to be, to be available to, to listen to the voice of God as I go throughout my day because There could be a moment where as Jesus walked through Jericho, he was just passing through, but he needed to stop. He needed to stop and take the time for a rich, wealthy man. He needed to stop as he was going about his business and take time for a poor, blind beggar. Those were divine moments ordained by God. And I'm convinced that so many of us have so many of those moments throughout our day and throughout our work week, man, that we pass by with blinders on unintentionally, but it's just because I've got a job to do and I've got appointments to keep and I've got a family to get back to and I've got chores at home and tasks and responsibilities and deadlines and all these things. And we miss the, 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 the gift Oftentimes, miracle moments right in front of our eyes where God wants to bless us. God wants to bless someone else through us, and he wants to use us. If there was ever a time that Jesus would have had every right to be self-consumed or to put the, the the attention back on himself, to be consumed with himself, it would have been at the cross. Wouldn't you agree? At the cross, where the people that he had poured his heart and soul into to love, stripped him naked, beat him within a breath of of death, and hung him on the cross. In that moment, Jesus had every right to be consumed with himself, yet still was so present in that moment that as the people who had beat him to near death, betrayed him, spat on him, mocked him, stripped him naked and abused him, as they all stood around and watched and mocked, he was still fully present in the moment, still fully focused on his mission, and he cried out to his heavenly Father, Father, forgive them. 
forgive them. Wow. And then there was a man who hung next to Jesus on the cross who was a, a thief and a crook and a criminal. criminal. He, was, he, was, he was trash in the eyes of society. And once again, Jesus had every right to be fully consumed with himself in that moment. But even in that final moment, he had the wherewithal, he had the capacity, he had the margin, he had this amazing ability to be fully in the moment with this man who, who basically said, I've done a lot of things wrong. Will you remember me? He's essentially saying, can you forgive me? And in that moment, Jesus said, this day, you will be with me in paradise. Thank God for a God who is ever present. He is always engaged in every moment of your life. And he is looking for those moments to interact and to embrace and to be engaged in your life every single day. And he's wanting you and I as his followers to have that same attentive, that same awareness, that same uh, spiritual uh, in, in, intuition to, to, to be able to listen to his voice and to act and respond to his voice throughout the moments, big moments and little moments throughout our day where he can use us. Can I just tell you this morning that he is with you now? Amen. Don't miss the gift of now. God is, God is with you now. You can be forgiven now. You can be set free now. You can be healed now. You can be delivered now. You can, you can come to Jesus now. You can call on him now. You can receive his peace now. In Jesus' name. Would you stand? Just a short reminder to you today, to all of us. Don't miss out on the gift of now. Would you bow your heads with me this morning and let's just ask God to, to give us the reminders throughout our day, to give us the heart, give us the desire to be present in the moment, remembering that he is ever present. He's as close as the mention of his name. All we have to do is whisper his name and he is there. He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Father, we love you this morning. God, I pray that there be one person here today who doesn't know you, one person today who, who just desperately needs your presence, desperately needs you in their life. They need your forgiveness of their sins today. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask that you would just come into our hearts today. Fill us with your presence today. Fill us with your Holy Spirit today. Forgive us of our sins today as we call on you to be our Lord and Savior. God, come into our hearts and lives. Be our Lord. Be our King. Be our Savior. Be our friend. God, we thank you that you went to the cross for us, that you stayed so laser focused on your mission. You stayed laser focused on the moment. God, that our sins could be forgiven, that we could know you, that we could live in relationship with you, God, and we are forever thankful and forever grateful for that today. And God, we just pray that you would just enable us, enable us to be present, enable us to live embracing the gift of now that you have given each and every one of us, Lord, to, to look for those opportunities to love on people the way you loved us. God, to see people the way that you saw us. God, help us to build in, to take the time, the margin, to have the capacity, the bandwidth, Lord, to go throughout our day, not hurried, not rushed, Lord, but looking for opportunities to be you to someone else. God, we thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for blessing us today. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Has God been faithful to anybody this morning?